We are installing a railway bridge over the Denbos Ring Road. It has to be put in place in just one night to minimize delays to the trains. They've built the bridge about 100 meters from the track to keep well out of the way of the train traffic. The route the bridge will take has got a bend. It's pretty narrow and there are pilings all over it, which the trailers will have to negotiate, so it's a tough job. Yes, it's all been calculated, of course, but we still only have 15 centimeters clearance one side and two centimeters on the other, and that's tight. The bridge is 110 meters long and 23 meters wide, so we'll have people in position at the key spots to watch that we don't hit the obstacles and get round the corner safely. That we have enough height with the paaltjes, that we nergens achter the dam blijven hangen, and that we daarom netjes door the bocht heen kunnen komen. There are 40 SBMTs under the bridge, 20 of them 6-axle, 14 4-axle and 6 of them power pack. They're set up in a curve to make the positioning easier. For me, this is a unique project. I've never moved anything this big before. This monster load moves slowly through the night towards its final position. Not a pleasant journey, because the weather is not cooperating. The rain is pouring down, so the public grandstand specially built for the event remains almost empty. Next morning, the crews from Wagenburg Nedlift begin to move the second viaduct into position less than 100 meters away. Once the steel plates are in place, the load slowly starts to move. This concrete slab, a wildlife bridge, is being installed to give wild animals free passage between different nature reserves. Although the distance to be covered is not so great, the challenge lies in the bend in the route, which means continual checking and measuring. This 2,300 ton job demands 100 SPMT axle lines with 400 wheels. Luckily, the SPMTs are fully compatible, so adding axle lines belonging to other companies is no problem. Although everything has been carefully prepared and brought up to the right height, this is still precision work because the bridge only has a couple of centimeters clearance. Henk Top, the project leader for this move, keeps a close eye on everything. The 50-meter journey is negotiated at a snail's pace. And then more measuring, because every millimeter counts. Several times, the monster moves back or forward a meter or so to finish up in exactly the right position. The Nedlift crew have an advantage today. The move can happen in the light of day, and it's a sunny one. And once the men with the calculators from Hymans are happy, this job is done.
We live in a time when new developments appear nearly every day. More and faster are standard demands, or in the transport world, bigger and heavier. Oil is the lubricant of our society. As the people at NAM know only too well, starting in 1947, NAM pumped around 120 million cubic meters of oil up from the depths under Stornebeck. From 1998, extraction became too expensive and the nodding donkey pumps disappeared. But there are still about 120 million cubic meters down there and NAM plans to use new technology to extract 20 million of them. Among other things, they need huge pressure vessels. There are two of these vessels, each of them 50 meters long and weighing about 70 tons. They are to be transported by Rensink BV of Almelo to Hochevein, where they will be sandblasted and treated against corrosion. After that, they have to be moved to the oil field near Schonebeek in the province of Drenthe. In the giant assembly hall of De Plantizer Industry, the vessels are loaded onto a three-bed five Scheuler low loader, equipped with extendable tank supports. Willem Boswinkel is driving the Notabom low loader, and Hoop is at the wheel of the four axle Scania 164G 580V8. Reversing inside, they maneuver backwards, forwards, backwards again, and again. The yard outside is scattered with construction materials, a real obstacle course. So Willem reverses in again and out again. No casual swing of the wheel on this job. It needs a lot of patience and skill. Even though the other end is also in the hands of a real professional, this stop and start maneuvering takes more than half an hour. Once the whole rig has finally emerged into daylight, he parks it by the gate, ready to leave. The weather forecast is not encouraging, promising a bad night with a lot of rain. Around 11 o'clock, the convoy sets off, and the security team have closed the main road so that Hube can make a wide sweep onto the highway. Slowly, the transport pulls out. Always an impressive sight. After a kilometre or so, the motorway approach means once more trying the patience of other road users. But with the low loader past the top, even that trial is over, and the transport rig disappears into the pouring rain, heading off at about 70 kilometres an hour towards its destination.
Moving huge tanks is not the only kind of job undertaken by rinsing. Now and then something very different turns up, like moving a super luxury houseboat from the boatyard to its moorings in the heart of the city of Daventer. Okay, so it's no world record distance, but 500 meters through city streets, load dimensions of 18 meters by six, and a weight of 130 tons all add up to an interesting challenge. The BKV Crane Company are already busy preparing for the planned departure time of 2200 hours. They've arrived with two hydraulic cranes to hoist the brand new floating home from the water. After the drivers have discussed their strategy, the cranes are driven into place and the setup can begin. Preparing the two cranes to lift is precision work because the whole combination has to be perilously close to the edge of the key. The weight of the machines has to be very carefully distributed to avoid subsidence. The tension is clearly visible on the face of the crane driver. Steel plates are unloaded from the trailers and placed under the massive outriggers. Once the weight is evenly spread between the outrigger legs and the cranes are loaded with a remarkable stack of counterweights, the spreaders and slings brought especially for this job are attached and slowly lowered into the water. By sunset, everything is ready to begin the lift. First, a good old-fashioned maneuver, as the concrete dream house is warped into position by hand. Centimeter by centimeter, it floats over the slings until they are precisely under the planned hoisting points. Then it's time for the Scheuler low loader to move into place, reversing the length of the none too wide little street, the 14 axles roll down to the waterside, ready to receive the full 130 tons. As soon as the trailer is positioned, the two cranes start their synchronized lift. Slowly and very carefully, the vessel rises from the water and is cautiously swung over the trailer. Slowly, the houseboat descends to its precisely calculated position onto the low loader, which groans as it takes over the full 130,000 kilos from the man-sized pulley blocks.
No time is wasted. As soon as the load is secure, the huge combination pulls away towards its destination. The transport combination moves up a narrow street, where the houseboat only just passes between the hanging signboards. Two yellow escort vehicles, one of which belongs to Rensink, close the side roads. This allows the first turn to the left to go smoothly. And then the evening crowds are suddenly treated to the sight of a houseboat sailing down Main Street. But 75 meters further, Hoop is confronted by a sharp right turn. With a rig length of nearly 25 meters, Hoop can't make it in one go. So he pulls ahead a bit to make the turn in reverse and continue on his way. Then, disaster strikes. During the turn at the crossroads, a steering rod snaps on the Scheuler trailer. That stops everything. A steering rod is not easy to repair, so the Rensink men have to improvise and disable the broken axle line by hydraulically lifting its wheels off the road. But problems come in twos. The hydraulic system gives up the ghost and a hose has to be replaced. The floating home is parked diagonally over the crossroads and can't move forwards or backwards. The light of dawn will be illuminating the streets before everything is fixed and the combination can finally reach its destination. Rotterdam is still one of the two busiest ports in the world. At all times of day, the biggest container ships moor up here to unload and load as quickly as possible. At the ECT container terminal, they are used to it. Their cranes work night and day, until, of course, they need a major service. When one of the cranes needs servicing, the Sarens company, with its famous SPMTs, will roll out to transport the machine to the specially set up worksite as quickly and carefully as possible. Once the crane has been inspected and can return to duty, the quayside is completely cleared for its journey. A costly business because delays in loading or unloading a ship cost the shipping company thousands of dollars. It is essential to keep these delays to a minimum. As soon as the transport rig is ready to move, work stops, even in the offices, and the personnel are asked to go somewhere else while the transport passes by. Halfway, the SPMTs pause to allow the other container cranes to go to their work sites. Then the men from Sarans start the last phase of their ride, inch-perfect maneuvers to end up exactly over the rails, where they set down their monster load on its own wheels once more. Here, the flexibility of the SPMTs really comes into its own. A complete 180-degree turn of pirouette is easily managed with a press of the button. And with axles that can move in any direction, the crane is quickly located above the rails. So now, it's up to the crane drivers to make up for lost time and get the ship ready to sail on schedule.
12 meters wide, 6 meters high, 25 meters long, and weighing 70 tons. We're talking about a helicopter pad. It's the men from HAK who face the task of backing this colossus into a production hall on a three-bed five configuration. But before it can happen, a number of things have to be connected up and loaded. Lots of checking and measuring, because it's essential that this combination stays in balance. This is another case which shows that even for transport of relatively lightweights, modern hydraulics have become indispensable. Speed and expertise are what clients want, but often the two don't go together. Jan takes his time positioning and lifting the load, but at last it's done. After careful checking, the whole contraption slowly rolls towards the production hall. The terrain is far from flat, so here too the hydraulic pumps are frequently used to keep the load in balance. There are obstacles along the route, which make maneuvers difficult. But once the route is cleared, the whole rig is delivered in front of the hall and the huge doors can be opened. Now it's time for Jan to show his steering skills. Inside the hall, work is continuing on the platform of which this helipad will become one part. Scaffolding and construction materials are scattered about in the way. So Jan is facing an obstacle course. He steers a winding route in reverse to bring his massive load within reach of the crane. This is driving skill at the highest level.
This is in fact the last job for this MAN tractor unit of HAK Transport. After this successful display of expertise, driver Jan von der Flist will be taking the wheel of a brand new MAN. A nice reward. Since the introduction of Liberty ships during World War II, there has been a steady increase in the practice of building of bigger and bigger ships in modules at different locations. The present generation of trailing suction dredges are still built in the same way, in sections. The heavy unfinished modules which together will make up a new dredger are moved by the Dordrecht firm Sarens from the construction hall to the quayside where the pontoon awaits them. An early morning delay, of course, as a crew of scaffolders running late delay the move of ship section number 1200. Here, the cutting suction head of a new beaver dredger, weighing 820 tons, must be moved down the slipway and onto a pontoon. Twice 18 axle lines are deployed here, rolling over steel ramps onto a Sarans twin barge. While the men from Sarans are hard at work on the final attachments, painters are still applying the last few licks of paint. Finally, after a serious delay, the scaffolders are finished. The last supports are removed from the module and the engines can be fired up to start the move. Although this construction hall is immense, there's not a lot of space left over for a smooth exit. Some back and forth maneuvering is needed, then a sideways move before the road forward is clear. Meanwhile outside, the pontoon has arrived and the ramps have been laid between it and the quayside. Module number 1200 may have a silhouette like something out of Star Wars, but luckily it moves at a slower pace. No complicated exercises are needed here, it's a straightforward move. Now and then the transport is paused while water is pumped out of the ballast tanks to keep the load evenly spread on the ramps.
After a couple of hours, the steel colossus is safely on the pontoon and the move can continue. This is over water to the next stage in constructing this powerful dredger. But the job doesn't end with module number 1200. The next task follows straight away. The cutting head of the suction cutter also has to be placed on a pontoon for transport to shipping company Van Ord's new ship. So some fast work is called for. For this loadout, the Siren's crew have brought in 30 double SPMT axle lines in order to carry the cutting head, 40 meters long and 11 wide, out of the construction hall and onto a pontoon. This load is so wide that a section of the hall's wall has to be removed. Outside the hall is a ship lift which they can't drive over, and of course there is a small matter of another building in the way. In order to reduce the length of this combination, the engines, or power packs, have been placed on top of the front part of the platform units. Even so, there is not enough clearance between the cutting head and doorway. So the cutting torch is used to remove yet another piece of wall. During the move out of the hall, Pascal Hilchers has to blindly follow the directions given by Mark. Pascal is standing with his back to the suction cutter between two lines of SPMTs, so he can't see where his huge load is going. To get outside without damage, he must first reverse, then attempt to pass through the hall doors with the wheels turned diagonally. Success comes at the third attempt, after the opening has been widened even more. Then, he must make a sharp left turn to avoid the ship lift. This lift cannot take the weight of such a huge load, and this clumsy drill head is not yet ready for contact with water. The maneuver goes smoothly, and once the monster stands level and safe by the quayside, the day's work is done. of planning and preparation have preceded the transport of three 540-ton transformers from Schiedam to the Tenet electricity substation in Bleiswijk. These transformers are needed 
to satisfy the increasing demand for power in the Western Netherlands. Thanks to careful preparation, this job goes smoothly, in spite of the many obstacles facing the move of these three giants. The transport starts at Mammut's heavy transport terminal, where the last of the three transformers is rolled onto the pontoon. It's heavy weather for heavy transport today in the port of Rotterdam. Rain and force eight winds are creating rough water, but it doesn't bother the tough lads from Mammut. Once all three pontoons are loaded deep in the water and the tugs are made fast, the journey over the Dutch rivers can begin. The pontoons must stay close together because bridges and locks cannot be kept open or closed for too long. So the vessels sail in close company as a convoy so they will keep waiting times for other traffic to a minimum. After some time waiting for the rail bridge in Gouda to open comes the last section of the voyage to Kouderkerk. This is as far as the convoy can go because the next bridge is too low for the huge transformers. From this point, the transport must continue by road. A temporary unloading quay has been constructed, and one by one the transformers start holding up traffic on the road. Very unusually, permission has been granted for this road transport to take place during the day. This impressive trio attracts a big audience as it moves through the middle of the village towards the N11 main road. It's clear that this route has needed some adaptation, as here and there traffic lights have been removed and steel plates have been laid to strengthen the road. All these measures, perfectly carried out, show that the exhaustive planning for this job has been effective. After the last obstacles in the built-up area have been negotiated and the railway line has been crossed, comes the crossing of the N11 and a wandering route through the countryside towards Benthausen. An almost idyllic route, that is if you're just strolling along with a rucksack. But there's no calm stroll towards the horizon for these three big boys. They are parked up for a while near Benthausen beside the high-speed rail line. Here the road passes under the railway twice. Because the transformers are so high, Mahmoud constructs a temporary road. It takes two days to build the road. So there's time for some maintenance on the SBMTs. You wouldn't expect it, but even these massive tires can be punctured and must be changed. You can't call in quick fit for this. You just have to get your hands dirty. When a huge quantity of steel, plate and wood is delivered, the rigs move forward a bit, then wait until a new section of road is laid. So the great convoy succeeds in covering two soggy kilometers without sinking in among the onions. On a disused site beside the A12, 
the next challenge is clear. Electricity grid company Tenet substation is on the other side of the motorway, which, to cap it all, runs over a raised embankment here. Mammut has come up with a clever solution for crossing the A12 here. To cope with the different levels, they plan to lift the transformers, along with their SPMTs, onto an undercarriage of yet more SPMTs. This, of course, is no mean task. First, the configuration of the SPMTs has to be changed, so the giant load has to be lifted off the transport units. Once the SPMTs have been coupled more closely together, the undercarriage for the stack version is ready, and this is again driven underneath the transformers, ready to leave the ground. The bottom section of this double stack is gigantic, four platforms wide and 12 axles long. 288 wheels are divided into hydraulic sections so that at all times the center of gravity can be adjusted to suit the situation. Steering this football pitch seems child's play when we see how easily one driver brings the monster precisely into position, ready to take on its heavy load. There's no hesitation. The wheels have hardly stopped rolling before the first transformer slowly rolls up the ramps to its elevated position. Well, there's a creak or groan of protesting metal here and there, but this extreme load is quickly in its place. Now, it sets out towards the waiting area beside the A12, where tomorrow morning, the first crossing will take place. The motorway authorities want the whole operation to be complete within two hours to minimize inconvenience to traffic. At five o'clock, the signal is given to begin and everyone involved in this masterful example of construction ingenuity watches keenly as the first double stack crosses the motorway, bringing the transformer up to the temporary bridge. In just 20 minutes, they have made the crossing and unloaded. Now, the bottom stack can drive back at the same time as the next load crosses the motorway. The first transformer now moves forward over the temporary bridge, which bends visibly under its weight. Take it easy is the watchword here. Once on the other side, 
it's only a few dozen meters more to the machine's final home in the new substation. The last crossing takes place as the sun rises, watched by a crowd of invited guests, all very impressed by this demonstration of pure professionalism. In less than two hours, the transport crew have completed their task. After years of preparation and 10 days on the move, suddenly it's over, and there's hardly a sign that this transport ever took place. At the Military Aviation Museum in Susterberg, many fine military aircraft are enjoying their retirement. Years in the open air, however, have not been good for the Lockheed Neptune SP-2H. Corrosion means that renovation and repainting are necessary. This will be done at Quality Aircraft Painting Services, based at Lelystad Airport. Royal Sun from Diemen with plenty of flying hours to its name, has been contracted as the specialist firm for the plane's road transport from Susterberg to Lelystad, and preparations are already well underway. Before the historic reconnaissance aircraft is moved, it has to be partially dismantled. The wings, propellers and parts of the tail have already been carried to Lelystad on a trailer. The fuselage, 27 meters long and 10 wide, is loaded onto the transporter. While the DAF CF drives out through the gates, a 220-ton Liebherr crane is being made ready on a bridge over the A28 motorway. The 220-ton Liebherr is ready for work when the transport combination slowly arrives. The men from San use their loader crane to make the Neptune fast to the lifting gear of the Liebherr. In a hoisting frame especially made to support the Neptune fuselage in the correct places, the aircraft takes off for probably the shortest flight in its history, over the bridge embankment and down onto the transport rig waiting on the motorway. Accompanied by four escorts, two of them on motorcycles, and by eight traffic controllers, 
the rig drives a little over 20 kilometers down the motorway before leaving it at exit 9 to Nykerk. It's remarkable how much traffic uses the A28 even in the small hours of the night. However, it has posed no problems. At the end of the exit, the Neptune has to turn left and pass a bridge over the A28. Here is the next challenge. The plane's tail is four and a half meters high and will not pass under the traffic lights. So a Liebherr LTM 1160 with 160 tons capacity gives the Neptune another brief leapfrog flight. After crossing the motorway, the next thing to negotiate is another bridge. Here, the combination cannot be too tall and also not too low because of the guardrails. Furthermore, the axle ground clearance is only 7 centimeters. Then follow the roundabouts at Nykerk and Hardewijk, the biggest obstacles on the route. The raised central islands mean a lot of careful maneuvering. Meter by meter, the combination creeps up and over the raised sections, watched closely by the escort personnel. With skilled driving, some wooden packing, and the removal of a few road signs, this obstacle is successfully negotiated and the journey to Lelystad continues, slowly but steadily. As the sun slowly rises, the combination stands ready for the Neptune's final takeoff. One more lift, and the load can cover the last meters to QAPS's enormous workshop hangar. And there, it is over to the paint specialists to bring this museum piece back to its former glory.
When the work is complete a few weeks later, it's once again over to Royal Sun. They will bring the reborn Neptune back to the museum. After all the hoisting experience of the first transport, placing the plane on the trailer goes even more smoothly. And within an hour, the combination is back on the road towards Susterberg. For now, the Neptune will stay wrapped in plastic. Only when her new home is ready will she be unveiled to emerge as one of the showpieces of the museum's collection. <laughs> 